June 26, 1975. Started out a beautiful day. The air was sweet and heavy after an especially violent overnight thunderstorm that all but blew our tents away. It had kept us up late, and I'd slept all night in my sleeping bag till 11 a.m. I listened to the women outside laughing and gossiping as they fixed breakfast on an open camp fire. And I remember one of them said, oops, I just dropped the pancake in the mud. And the other one said, just wipe it off. They'll never know the difference. And I laughed to myself because they were right. We'd never notice. And I could smell the wonderful smell of those pancakes. And I was already envisioning the thick syrup. I'd soon be trickling over them, followed by several cupfuls of tongue-scalding hot black coffee. But suddenly, suddenly this beautiful, this peaceful morning was cut short by the staccato sound of gunfire. It seemed far off at first, and I dismissed it as someone practicing in the woods. Then I heard screams. My heart nearly leaped out of my chest. Our spiritual camp had abruptly become a war zone. I instantly thought of all the women, children, old people up at our tent camp, and of our elderly hosts, Harry and Cecilia Jumping Bull, up at their house in the hill. That was why they called us here, to save their lives. I pulled on my boots. I grabbed my shirt my old rifle, and rushed out of the tent. I started running for the house where the jumping bulls lived. And the de heat of the day hit me like a fist. And as I ran, trying to wipe the sweat from my eyes, I dropped my ammo bag, I remember. Bullets were flying past my head just in inches away. No way of telling who was firing at whom. I had to drop onto my belly and crawl. Keeping in the woods for cover, I finally made it to the jumping bull house, and to my relief, found that Grandpa and Grandpa Jumping Bull weren't even there. Thankfully, they'd left the property at dawn that morning and gone to a steer auction in Nebraska. I ran over to the little shack next door where I heard children's voices wailing in fright. Bullets were snapping at my heels as I ran, barely missing me, just the way you see it happen in the movies. I realized, realized I was drawing gunfire to the shack. And if I tried to rescue the kids right then, I'd only endanger them even more. I made a beeline out of there to draw the gunfire away from the house and took temporary cover by a stand of trees nearby. I tried to figure out what the hell's going on. Two cars, those shiny black cars that always meant trouble for Indians, were parked askew from each other, their red blinkers flashing in a field out toward the road, maybe 150 yards away. That's where the first shots I'd heard had been coming from. But now the sound of gunshots came from behind me, ahead of me, seemingly from every direction. Were we surrounded? Were we about to be slaughtered? I fired off a few shots into the air just to show we had some kind of a defense so they didn't just roll in and slaughter us. A few other brothers were doing the same with the few rifles we had. Like me, they fired every so often from a distance at those two unknown and unannounced interlopers who'd come roaring onto the jumping bull property without warning. We were just trying to buy time. They were the ones with the latest high-power military weaponry, not us. And after a while, when we realized that the drivers of those two shiny cars were already apparently dead, slouched beside their vehicles in pools of blood, and that they weren't goons, who were the paramilitary hitmen, other Indians, but they were FBI men. At that moment, we could only look at each other in shock disbelief, because if those agents were dead, we, those of us Indians at the Jumping Bull property that day, whether man, woman, or child, were as good as dead, too. We knew we wouldn't be taken alive even if we tried to surrender. Only a few minutes before, I'd been lazing in my tent, yawning and smiling and stretching, looking forward to that nice plate of hot pancakes smothered in syrup. And now, I was a dead man. We were all as good as dead. I'm telling you here only what I personally saw and experienced and felt at that time, one man's very limited perceptions in a scene of near total chaos, not how it was described, often in infinite, gory, and fabricated detail by the FBI and the prosecutors later. <coughs> Since you can never believe anything they say, it's impossible to trust a single piece of their evidence. They have fabricated bullet casings, firing mechanisms, old rifles, anything to pin this murder on me, even though they themselves have later admitted in court they have no idea who killed the two agents. I didn't see the agents die. I had no hand in it. I would have done
done anything to stop it. I'd only known at the time. But at that point, there was nothing I or anyone else could do. It was done. There were dozens, maybe hundreds, of FBI, local lawmen, goons, and white vigilantes out there suddenly appearing within minutes, as if out of nowhere, and they were all gunning for us. And two of their buddies lay injured, probably dead, in the crossfire zone between us. No, we weren't likely to be gently handled by them if we surrendered. Bigfoot's people had surrendered at Wounded Knee, remember, back in 1890. Even the elders and the women and the children would be shot, as they'd done with such relish at Wounded Knee 1 in 1890, and even less provocation. They would hunt us down, as they did then, through the creek beds, through the gullies, every man, every woman, every elder, every child. They would hunt us down and shoot each of us through the head as they'd done back in 1890. After all, their buddies were dead. And we, we were Indians. When a white man is killed, even if he brought it on himself, all Indians are guilty. Isn't that the way it's always been? I could go on here as he reads, writes about these how he was saved by the eagle, and they actually got out of that encircling ring of crazed longmen. Lots more about it, but now I will cut to the chase here. He goes on to say, we, we must each be an army of one in that endless struggle between the goodness we are all capable of and the evil that threatens us all, not only from without, but from within. Yes, we can. We can be an army of one, each of us. One good man. A one good woman can change the world. Are you that man? Are you that woman? If so, may the Great Spirit bless you. And if not, why not? We must each of us be that person. That would transform the world overnight. That would be a miracle, yes. But a miracle within our power. Within our healing power. We can do it. You and I and all of us together, yes we can, and now is the time. Now is the only possible time. Let great healing begin.